Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me is News Editor Tung okay. and Adventure Editor Crafty. Hello. This week we're dissecting a wish list of Japanese performance cars we need to see again. We'll give you our thoughts on some new entrants to the Cars Guide garage this week. And we'll catch up with the person who makes money when he pays a fine in this week's Musk Watch. So stay with us. But first, we've had some feedback. And our subject last week was the new hardtop version of the new generation Land Rover Defender. And there was lots of love for it. You know, after we went through that particular version, the Land Rover Defender in general got a lot of likes. Um, David Anson thinks it's a good looking rooster. Um, and uh, Hammer Rocks. Loves it. Strong contender for his next car. He's hoping Land Rover screws it together as well as they've designed it. Now, he's just got fingers crossed that the Nitra plant in Slovakia um, does a better job than Solihull in the UK. Um, In his experience, uh, he's sensing that might be the the case, but we'll see. (laughs) Now, 88 MTB 88 would buy a Defender instead of a Ute, and that's part of the discussion. We were saying, you know, it's a stripped out version. It could have that really hard working kind of role in front of it. He says, if you're trying to take anything bulky, you'd still use a trailer because when you think about a dual cab ute, the tray in those is, is pretty modest um, mm-hmm. anyway. Plus the ride and handling will be on point. So I think that's uh, that's fair comment. But I, the interesting one here, and I'll get um, your thoughts on it, Crafty. Pranav Shroti has said he loves the look of this new Defender. However, some hardcore off-road people say it's n- if it's not live axle, then it's not a true off-roader. Is that really the case? What are your thoughts? Where, where do you stand on that, Crafty? Oh, mate, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a stickler for tradition as well, so I, I kind of agree. But, I mean, we're, we're in the 21st century now. We've had independent suspension around for ages. Um, and independent suspension in combination with traction control systems and all that sort of driver-assist tech uh, in low-speed, low-range, four-wheel driving, I mean, it's enough to get close to driving a solid axle vehicle. A solid axle, uh, the one wheel goes up, the other one goes down. It's, it's just pure physics. Uh, an independent uh, suspension, the one wheel will move of its own accord and the other one doesn't react directly mm. to mm. what the other one is doing. So the theory is that with a live axle or beam axle, whatever you want to call it, when a wheel goes up, you'll get plenty of wheel travel the other side. You'll get optimum wheel travel because the other wheel will drop to the dirt, uh, if not as close as as yes, as gotcha. Yes, possible. yes, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, again, yeah, I kind of agree with him, but um, I've had mates. I haven't driven this thing. Uh, the The international launch of the Defender was called off. They had a preliminary launch in Namibia, uh, and by all accounts, it went fine. Right. Uh, I mean, in a modern vehicle, you have to make concessions to on-road ride and handling and comfort, and that's where the independent suspension comes in. By all accounts, it was very capable off-road. It's when you get into the really heavy hardcore off-roading, you get a a live front axle as well, like a a rigid front axle, rigid rear axle. That's when you're really getting serious about it. Exactly, exactly. Um, The Defender was always going to polarise opinion. I mean, I, I, (laughs) I feel for the guys that... A Jaguar Land Rover because you're never going to please your, your gung ho hardcore Defender lovers of old. Yeah. And you're not going to entirely please people who perhaps want to spend more time in their Defender, you know, in an urban setting. Yes. So I, I think they've come up with a pretty good compromise. I'll be driving it in the next month or two at the Australian launch. Brilliant. So I'll, I'll have more of an idea, sort of, you know, a driver direct idea of, of how it feels sort of on road and off road. But yeah, yeah, like I say, I kind of agree with him. So good point. Very good. All right. Now, Bugatti fan, um, he says in the UK, we were talking about the fact that there's 90 and 110 in terms of uh, different wheelbases. wheelbase. We also up. touched on the 130. And he said that in the UK, that 130 will be an eight seater. So okay. it would be interesting to see whether or not that makes it here because that would be quite a vehicle. Yeah. Um, so yeah. thank you for that, Bugatti fan. And Andrew KNI has touched on the recently announced uh, Ineos, 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 uh, <laughs> Grenadier, which looks a lot like the outgoing Defender. 
Um, it's almost a, a replacement for that vehicle, if you like. BMW engine, Z, ZF gearbox, uh, and various others came in response to him and said, I like the look of it. When will it arrive? Um, and how much is it going to cost? Crafty, you've got the inside line on this because you've, you've had some exposure to it. I, they, they held a press conference uh, online, of course, uh, towards the end of June. Uh, it was all very interesting stuff, and you've got to give it to these guys. They've, they've built it from the ground up. And this is, is probably the Defender that hardcore Defender lovers wish the new right. one would mm. be because this is, uh, is uh, solid axles all around, uh, permanent four-wheel drive. This, this, is, yeah, this thing is built for purpose, um, yeah. which the Ineos, Ineos guys uh, are really sort of really staunch about, um, having it built for purpose, not so much for styling. Um, yes. If you look at any images of the thing, it really is a, a heavy nod to Defender, to vehicles that are, uh, you know, have a wheel at each corner, like the Pajero or the G-Wagon or the Jimny, you know, those sort of things. Yep. Uh, yep. Really a point and drive sort of straight out of the car yard, four-wheel drive. Um, pricing, they said they didn't want to sort of hit G-Wagon stratosphere pricing uh, they wanted to stick to around uh, their, their words, not mine, Tom. Um, they wanted to stick to around sort of, uh, you know, uh, Raptor pricing around yep. there. I, I think it'll, it'll probably creep a little bit higher than that, so sort of early 80s or something. Yeah, right. Uh, and I don't think they'll make a lot of them. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, certainly uh, relatively speaking to other uh, four-wheel drives. But, yeah, this, this is an exciting thing. Uh, and it's exciting to follow its progress. Um, and to, to, I, I like to think of it as inside the box thinking, in that, you know, here's JLR well, thinking it looks outside like a box. the box. <laughs> where are, where, yeah, good point. Where, where are we going to take Defender? And they're thinking, hold on, that'll leave a hole where the Defender used to be, which yeah, I think absolutely. is, is re really clever. But yeah. they haven't even decided yet where they're going to build it um, in volume. Is that right? Uh, no, that's correct. They did. They did mention a couple of uh, regions, but um, yeah, I don't think anything is 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 sort of fully decided at the moment. Yeah. So. so it's still kind of early days. You'd have to say it's going to be a a late next year type proposition, or maybe early the year after. Yeah, I think I think especially with the circumstances in which the world finds itself uh, at the moment, I think yeah, I sort of later rather than sooner. So probably late. 21, mid-22, 22, 22 something like that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I do remember they, they did mention uh, uh, production at an Austrian plant. So, uh, sorry, right I don't know. I took copious notes, but obviously I've lost, <laughs> I've lost those. So, <laughs> but the yarn, my yarn is on carsguide.com. So give me Okay. Me. Cool. Now, we'll just move on to more general commentary. And uh, Garth Rudlin came at us and said, afternoon, tool holders. And I suppose I do, you know, hold a, hold a tool from time to time, so to speak. Um, do you know if the Stinger engine will get a ride in a coupe-style SUV, Kia or Hyundai, to take on the Germans, um, perhaps Genesis brand? Just a thought. And what I would say is that that Lambda V6 is used already in various Genesis sedans. Um, the G70, G90, it was used in the just uh, discontinued G80. Um, and the Kia K9, which is a car that we don't see here, which is another sedan. Um, but the new G80 and GV80 use a next generation 3.5 litre um, smart stream um, engine. And the GV80 Coupe, I would have thought, will be a real chance. And in fact, a, a blog come website called Naked Spy Shot, a uh, Naked uh, Spy Shot blog called KKS has had a crack at one. So people um, having a look on YouTube will see that um, as we speak. But I would have thought, Tung, that that's, a, that's a, a decent chance that as those aspirations grow for the brand, yep. that they'll do that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, when you're a brand like Genesis and you want to take on, you know, the big Audis, BMWs, Mercedes, you've got to play in the spaces they play in. And, you know, something that they've expanded in very recently is the Coupe SUV. So it just makes mm. sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you've got to balance innovation with fishing where the fish are. You know, you, you yep. want to be in that market and take them on, as you say, and, and leave some room for something to surprise and delight to one side. So it's, totally. it's a tricky juggling act. 
Um, hope that answers you, you, your thought there, Garth. Then David Bird, who I like to call Birdie. In fact, he's told me his nickname is Birdie. So Birdie, a proud, Birdie. A proud Birdie. Victorian, says, I reckon Richard is on his own when it comes to the styling of the forthcoming BT50. Now, Richard didn't see it as a cohesive design. He thought the front and rear didn't marry up. It had been designed by two groups that were probably in their teens, um, that kind of thing. <laughs> he was he was fairly harsh. Um, but but Bertie says, remembering that the current that current BT fifty owners walk towards their vehicle from the rear or with their eyes closed. <laughs> so he's more or less saying, you know, pretty much anything's going to be an improvement. But then, do we have confirmation of the Prado model year twenty one upgrade? Can't wait for Crafty to give it a solid review. But, Tung, have you got any uh, mail on that? Uh, look, we know there is an update coming. Uh, yep. You know, we, we absolutely know that. Uh, you know, the current Prado uses that 2.8-litre uh, turbo diesel engine from the Hilux, and we know yep. the Hilux is getting a big engine upgrade. Uh, we're probably not going to see the Prado, you know, get that 150-kilowatt, 500-newton-metre tune. It's probably still going to be a little bit lower than that. Yeah. Um, you know, when it's coming... Look, Toyota have a lot on their plate this year. They've got Hilux, they've got Yaris, they've got Fortuna to launch. We're probably not going to see it until, you know, early next year. Yes. And, you know, other things to come on it, you know, expect to see like Apple CarPlay, Android Auto support, you know, increased cabin, you know, comfort, that sort of thing as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. But it's, it's got such a strong fan base. Um, I totally. don't hear what you're saying, that Toyota does have a lot on its plate. But I suppose they've got to think, well, Prado is important. How do we prioritise these things? Uh, yeah. um, it's, what, it's what the sausage machine is spitting out, you know, in, in Japan. Um, yeah. But they, they've got to think about the local market at the same time. Absolutely, yeah. Um, now, de Kook, um, one, of, one of Richard's great mates, de Kook, who's uh, come to live in Australia, ex of Germany, he gives us some insight about Mazda. And we were talking about how Mazda in the, uh, the new BT50 will possibly give Isuzu some help in terms of making its interiors feel a little more premium, that kind of stuff. There might be some rub off in the collaboration on BT50 and D-Max. Um, and he says that, look, in Germany, Mazda is on par with premium brands. A top spec CX-5 with a bit less fruit without the turbo costs a whopping Australian dollars, 75K in Germany. So it's on par with Countryman and X1 and cars like that. While down here, you get the Akira Turbo Petrol for a bit over 45k. So he's saying that in other markets, it's quite interesting where Mazda sits. Um, that's a bargain worth switching to BMW from BMW to, um, even more so since the interior quality is better than the budget Bimmers and Audis. So um, that's an interesting perspective. Then John Lewis, um, I wonder whether it is in fact Johnny Lewis and we could get a, a few boxing tips um, <laughs> from him. Uh, he, we were talking about local manufacturing in Victoria and what had been built there and Renaults of various stripe. Uh, he says, not sure about the Renault 4, but the Renault 12, Renault 16, as well as later Peugeot 4, uh, 404, 504 and early 505 as well as TE Ford Cortina wagons um, <laughs> were built in the Renault Australia factory in West Heidelberg, Victoria. So there you go. Thank you, Johnny. And, um, you know, keep them up and make sure you, <laughs> you click on the, on the reflexes. <laughs> Stick and move. Stick and move. Stick and move. move. Stick and, move. Uh. Um, and then, finally, Stuart Marler, uh, we, we, we put out a couple of his comments from last week. He said, gosh, I heard my name so many times I thought I was in trouble with the missus. So uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry to do that to you, Stuart. But uh, you, you came up with some good points, so we had to give them a run. But we'll, we'll move on now to our major topic of conversation. And our own Spencer Leach wrote a piece uh, during the last week or so where he was just casting some ideas out there. We've got some cars coming our way, like a 400Z uh, Nissan, for example. Um, we've got the Supra already. Well, if we went back quite a few years to the 90s, what were some of the contemporary models that kicked off then that ran, but we've since lost? And he wants them back pretty badly. Um, and he's called out Mitsubishi's, Toyota's, various others. Tung, can you kind of pick up the, the trail here and tell us where Spencer was heading? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, um, it's quite obvious at the moment we're in a bit of a, you know, Japanese sports car renaissance. Uh, like you said, you know, the Supra is back. We've got uh, a Civic Type R. We've got an NSX. 
Uh, you know, it's all looking pretty good for, for JDM sports car fans like myself. Um, but there's, there's still a few key models I think we're missing. Um, right. or at least Spencer uh, thinks that we're missing. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of a, a wish list, if you will, of what other cars we'd like to see back. And yeah. for me personally, it's it's got to be the Mitsubishi Lancey ev Evolution, right? Yes. Uh, wow. You know that <laughs> rally car. That car was quintessential in in you know my f falling in love with cars. Uh, you know back in the nineties, uh, back when I was a kid. So um, you know we we have a new Subaru WRX coming in the next couple of years. Uh, yeah. I know you often you often go back to your diaries, don't you, Tung? And you you yeah. you run your eye over that passionate <laughs> poetry that you've written to the 100%. to the ego. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. I keep that on my bedside table <laughs> and I read it every couple of nights. <laughs> yeah, it's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Heartfelt stuff. Well, Scary, I mean, but good. <laughs> when, when Mitsubishi was making its wholesale pivot towards SUVs um, and in this new alliance setting, you know, it has its own kind of uh, silo to, to stick within. But an SUV Evo was ch talked about quite a bit that it, that it could take a new form, but yeah. still have that kind of appeal. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's talk about electric motors as well. They released yep. a concept car, which uh, the lovely Matthew Pritchard is probably flashing up on screen right now uh, <laughs> yep. for our YouTube viewers. But, uh, you know, it wouldn't be the first time that Mitsubishi has used an Evolution badge on an SUV, is it? No, no, absolutely. What was the one um, Spencer called out? There's, um... oh, anyway. Uh, yes, it's something that they've got in their bag of tricks that they can and draw yep. out and apply. But... To satisfy the fans such as yourself, they'd want to do a comprehensive job. You just don't want stickers and, you know, racy wheels. It'd have to be something pretty substantial to live up to that tag. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Is, then, the, is the danger, though, Tom, that they reel out a couple of these things just arbitrarily and they don't satisfy diehard fans and they don't satisfy sort of newcomers to the thing? Is, it, is that the danger or, or not? Of course. I mean, I think anticipation and expectation is always a, a very dangerous thing to sort of handle. But, um, yeah. you know, all cars these days are, are, are just so good. They're built to such a good quality. And, you know, as controversial as something like the Super is, I think if you look at that objectively, uh, it's still, you know, a very competent sports car. And, yeah. you know, very successfully carries on the torch from its predecessors. Um, yeah. So I think the Japanese have this almost respect or reverence for what's come in the past and they they don't necessarily they won't just do something for the sake of reviving the name yeah. you know, yeah. 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 It's, just... it's interesting you talk about living up to expectations and it's a bit like when crafty walked in the room everyone has high expectations <laughs> and then there's this sort of slow deflation and, and realization of what's actually happened slow um, deflation but... is pretty quick <laughs> It was like when the, I was born, Jason. You know, pop down, they just went up. Uh, but the, we, the, we put the other one, up there? I don't know. The other one that, that rings a, a large bell, of course, is Celica uh, or Celica, depending on where you are. And <laughs> at the launch of the, the Supra in Australia, I was talking to Tetsuya Tada, the person who was the chief engineer for that program, and 86, by the way. Um, and I said to him, so what's next? You know, um, where do you turn your attention to now? Because he's finished with 86, he's finished with Supra. I said, is it an MR2? Um, is it a, a Celica? And he said, yes, Celica, 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 but four-wheel four -wheel drive. Like that would be its point of difference because yeah. I said, well, you've got the 86, it's a rear-wheel drive. Is yeah. it going to be front drive? He said, no, all-wheel drive. So yeah. it's a real chance, I reckon, that there'll be another Celica and it could be taking a bit of that rally flavour and applying it in all-wheel drive terms. Yeah, I mean, talking about Toyota and their rallying efforts, uh, yep. there is a Yaris GR, you know, um, coming up around the corner. That's got all-wheel drive, you know. Yep. That was built on uh, Toyota's experience of uh, rally racing. So, yep. you know, is it is it that much of a stretch to to imagine uh, a new generation Celica with the same, you know, drivetrain as that Yaris GR? Yeah, I, I think it would be brilliant. And when you think about the impetus of you know, Akio Toyota at the top of the business saying, we want to make ever better but exciting cars. So we're seeing the evidence of that now in the Supras and, and 86s and other models that have come through. You're not as surprised as you might have been five years ago um, to see a Celica emerge. So it would be pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Now, 
The other one that has been kicked from pillar to post ever since it disappeared with the RX-8 is a new RX sport, uh, sports car from Mazda, be it RX-7, RX-8, call it what you will. There are people that are, you know, young blokes now, Tonga, writing their diaries with odes yep. to a rotary engine. They want, yep. they want that to reappear. And I, I'm, just gonna, Mazda's been, I, I'm Mazda's, just going to put my car on the table right now. I used to own an RX-8, so... Okay. Uh, yep. that, is a, that is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> yeah. And, and they've been teasing us with, you know, the RX Vision concept car and various others um, that look terrific, but um, zero kind of uh, product that's come out of those concepts so far. Yep. Yeah, well, we know we know a rotary is coming back. Uh, they, Mazda have confirmed that they're going to use a rotary engine uh, in conjunction with you know, uh, the MX-30 all-electric SUV as sort of like a range yeah. extender. Range extender, yep. Yep. Um, they've yet to confirm it in a sports car. Uh -huh. You know, we're all, we're all waiting with bated breath. Uh, but, you know, when we, one of our uh, journalists, Stephen Corby, had a chat to Mazda back at the Tokyo Motor Show, uh, Mazda were kind of questioning whether the environment, you know, the world is willing to accept a rotary sports car anymore. You know, it's not it's not an efficient engine by any means. Uh, you know, it chews yep. through a lot of oil, a lot of petrol. Um, emission mm. standards are, are tightening. You know, can they develop and deliver a car, you know, to meet all these expectations? Yes. Well, it sounds yeah. like the same issues that plagued the engine in the beginning of its development, and it's kind of why Mercedes-Benz parked it to one side and said, no, I don't think we're going to progress, was around those uh, sealing and compression issues, the the wear on the rotor tips and the subsequent kind of emissions issues that flow, uh, just getting on top of those, it hasn't really happened. So in the current environment with such tight emissions regs, um, I'm sure that's what's um, causing them to think twice about it. Yeah, totally. But if anyone could do it, it's Mazda. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. I mean, they're, they're the closest to it by far. And then the end of this uh, quartet wish list is uh, another Mitsubishi, but this time, it's the 3000 GT. I think it was called GTO in some, some other markets, yep. uh, which was the all singing, all dancing, all wheel drive, big turbocharged um, sports car. And uh, Spencer wants to see that make a return. <laughs> that car was a bit ahead of its time when it came out, wasn't it? It was. It was. And look, I was there and drove it in period when it was launched. <clears throat> and it was heavy. It was a heavy car. It was more than 1.7 tonnes. When you had cars like the RX-7, a twin-turbo rotary was far, far lighter and more nimble. This was a big kind of... When the R32 GTR arrived, it felt lightweight compared to the 3000 GT. Um, yeah. It was planted, hunkered down on the road and a big beast that just kind of owned the road. Um, you don't know... I, I, I doubt there's a market with... Nissan owning that with the GTR, whether Mitsubishi had been in a position to come back on that one. <laughs> yeah. No. All right. Well, it, it would be great to get people's thoughts. If they're out there hankering for any of these four or others that we're not necessarily considering, let us know your thoughts. Is it 2020? Is it the right time to be thinking about these kinds of cars or not? It'd be great to get your feedback. Um, but we are going to now move to our garage where cars that you can drive and do exist currently reside and crafty i'd like to kick it off with you this is a car that sounds like the cheap jeans that you know certain kids got whereas the other kids got the fancy <laughs> jeans we're, yes. we're talking about it. trail riders yeah a uh, trail rider that's correct yeah that's correct um it's the ldv t60 trail rider 2 bit yep. of a mouthful um, before I get cracking on that, I just want to say I did go sort of noticeably quiet during that whole last segment <laughs> because because you guys are talking about fast, stylish, good-looking things that go faster than walking pace. Right. I got no idea. I got no. You're not going to go rock hopping in a uh, 3000 GT, really, are you? No, no, no. no not not without some some uh, damage. Rock rails. You'd you'd want some serious protection around exactly. and a bit of a lift lift kit. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So the Trail Rider Two is is obviously the second generation of the Trail Rider, which was the Aussie sort of tuned suspension offering, um, in the T six. T sixty is a dual cab Ute for anyone yeah. who's so it, L L D V T sixty. Yep. That's yep. correct. Yeah. Um, I was I, I I was pretty impressed with the Trail Rider. 
uh, that Aussie tuned suspension was was getting pretty close to right for that sort of vehicle. Um, it was a whole lot better than the than the standard lineup. They they all carry that suspension now, just to make that okay. clear. Okay. Um, all, all new uh, T60s. Um, it's sort of aimed at the budget premium end of the market, JC, sort of a little bit cheaper. Um, yeah. I, I drove the auto and that was that was priced a little bit over 42 drive okay. away. And for yeah. me, I think it's just a little bit too overpriced for what you're getting. You do get a lot. Um, yeah. It's quite a nice cabin. Uh, it's quite a nice driving ute on road. Pretty capable off road. Feels kind of low to me. Like it's uh, it's, but it's got two hundred and fifteen mil ground clearance. Um, uh, yeah, very very capable, very comfortable. Because well, in is. the in the earlier days of Chinese uh, models coming to this market, some of the really entry level cars would come out of the clouds with something like leather trim. It was very odd that. Uh, that what we would traditionally see as a premium option was yeah. fitted standard. Is there any of that still going on with LDV? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and, and the cabin is, is, a, is a nice space. The seats are pretty comfortable. It's got a massive uh, multimedia screen, uh, right. 10 inches. Um, yeah. Really nice and crisp and clear until you come to use the bird's eye view camera or the 360-degree camera. Um, it gets a bit sort of muddy looking. That was, that was one of right. my sort of nitpicking uh, points okay. uh, in the review. Um, I wouldn't rely on that camera, uh, and also for reversing, like it becomes a bit sort of muddy looking the screen. Yep. But otherwise, um, uh, not notwithstanding the fact that you were in the mud. I was in the mud. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, camera, the cameras all around were covered with mud. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it's kind of a. It's uh, overall, I'm sensing it's pretty positive, but you're just worried a little bit about the money, or. or what does it boil I, down to? You know, I, I think it's just a little bit too overpriced. It's a whole yep. lot better than what they were a couple of years ago, and these things yep. launched a few years ago, and they, and they were pretty impressive then. Uh, right. I mean, they sort of signalled big leaps ahead in, in the sort of cheap end of the ute market. But still, uh, I mean, and, and as we were talking about earlier, I'd put my money in, a, in, a, in, in something that's proven, uh, long-standing, something like the, the Triton, uh, where you're also, you know, you get a lot of standard features for the money. You're getting a, a really good 4 by 4 system. Yes. Um, I just think the sort of risk factor you are to, but to some people it's appealing. And, I mean, yep. Yep. you know, again, um, it's, it's quite a lot of stuff for your, for your money. Um, yep. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I see a few of them around, um, a trail riders that is. So yes. The, the first gen. Mm. Um, so, you know, obviously some people see, see the value in, in, absolutely. Uh, I mean, from little yeah. things, big things grow. You never, you never know, uh, what might be not too far away for that brand. It's already oh. doing so well in the commercial van space. Yeah, for sure. Was that a Paul Kelly? Uh, it Paul? was, mate. It was. Yeah. I mean, I, I generally give him a, a kind of subtle shout out during the podcast. He appreciates <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, lots, yeah, lots of fun. Lots of fun. Cool. Thank you, Crafty. Now, Tung, we're going to move to something just a little bit different that you've yep. been steering uh, this week. Fill us in on your wheels. Uh, yes, I've been spending a bit of time in a Nissan Juke, uh, the new generation version, the second generation version, um, you know, just the, just the base spec one, the ST. Um, and it's, look, I, it's good. It's good. It is let down by one major thing. Look, let me run run you through the positives first. You know, I think uh -huh. I think the styling of the new Do you generation. Want the good car. news or the bad news? <laughs> okay, we're going to get the good news. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I think the styling of the new generation car looks looks you know much better than it did before. I think the the bulbous kind of front end frog like look of the, the previous the initial generation. one had the the gator eyes, the gator eyes, That's like it. you know, yep. that, coming at you out of the uh, out of the big pond. Yeah, it's pretty yep. ordinary yep. looking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So this one just looks a bit more, uh, I guess, modern, sleek. Uh, fits yep. in, in the into the car park a little bit better, you know, amongst the sea of Mazda CX-3s and Toyota CHRs. Uh, the engine is is quite nice. Uh, Eighty-four kilowatt, one hundred and eighty-five newton meter, one liter turbo, three cylinder. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, so three cylinder engines have have come uh, come quite a long way, and I think you know that much power and torque in a car of that size just works. It's plenty. You know? 
Yeah, yeah it's okay. your inner city Good. runabout. You know, it's, yeah. it's you don't need it to go super quick, super fast, so it works well. Mm -hmm. uh, the in cabin technology is great now. Uh, you know, there's an eight inch uh, multimedia touchscreen. Uh, you know, it's floating style. So on the center console, it looks uh, it looks modern, looks well integrated. Uh, the big letdown, I think, is the transmission. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Seven speed dual clutch automatic. Uh, yep. It's got that usual dual clutch, low speed creep, you know, okay. jerkiness that you yes. kind of find. Um, yes. It's almost. I don't know. For, for some reason, the way this car has been calibrated, it just seems especially janky. Uh, right. I've come away from 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 a stop, uh, you know, right. at, you know, smoothly at all in the week that I had the car. So yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. You're not the only one to have uh, recorded that uh, in terms yeah, of yeah. first impressions with the car. That's for sure. But yeah. what's your recollection, Tung, in terms of ride quality in, in the car that you had? Do, does anything come to mind on that score? Look, I thought I thought it was okay. Um, yep. You know, I recently have driven the Toyota CHR, and I thought the Toyota was a little bit more comfortable, was a little bit right. better. Right. Uh, you know, I, I don't recall any instances of hating the ride quality. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, no. That's that's the only, only reason I ask I was with our own uh, Matt M4 Campbell yesterday, and we were doing some car swaps, and I got a, a brief steer. You know, twenty odd kilometers in the top spec. Yeah. Um, the, the, the letters and numbers which escape me at the moment. And we weren't on the most perfect roads, admittedly, but I thought, oh, this is a bit uh, not, not great. Uh, but yeah, but, but, but th th probably needs a little more time to give a more considered kind of opinion on yeah. that one. It just struck maybe, me though. Maybe the larger wheels. Uh, Could on, be. On the, you know, top spec one really does affect uh, ride quality in a bad Who way. Knows? Who knows? But another interesting fact about the Duke is, um, you know, the base car is now – about three and a half thousand dollars more expensive than it was before, wow. so it's 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 just under twenty eight grand. And uh, the Duke used to be Nissan's cheapest model. Wow! Uh, but now you can get a Navara, a Bogo Navara, for less than a Duke. No wow. way! Because no the way. Duke the Duke wasn't exactly setting the world on fire sales wise before yeah. this new one arrived. And if it's three k dearer, uh, yeah. that's an interesting strategy to increase volume if that's the aim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's you know the cost of all the safety tech that they put in there. Right. Wow. Good point. Good point. Wow. Good point. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I will chip in with the car that I've been driving this week, which is a BMW Z4, and it's the M40i. So it's the top of that tree. And I have just got to say, what a cracking car! It's it's not for everybody because it's it's a six figures. It's 127 grand, but it's that three liter turbo petrol inline six eight speed auto. It's 285 kilowatts, which is a little more than the Supra. Um, they develop the same torque. It's a convertible, of course. And in the plus column I've got, it goes hard. It just is, is such a cracking engine. And it sounds great. It, it steers beautifully. I was in it going, this is a, this is a BMW. And it, it's absolutely, the road feels great and it's so accurate. Um, really enjoyed driving it. It's rigid as it's like a solid billet uh, of steel. It's very rigid. Uh, for a convertible particularly. Um, folding the top is an absolute cinch. It does all that stuff. Lots of fruit and lots of safety um, in the car. I found getting in and out with the top up really <laughs> quite strong, you know. I'm a, I'm a man of a certain age these days, and I just thought if, you, if you're driving this car regularly, if you've got it as a daily driver, it does become a little bit uh, tedious um, getting in and out of the thing. But, uh, and the Super GDS is 30K less. So, all right, yes, you've got a hard roof, but that's the equation that you might face up to. Do you want the BMW for 30K more and a folding roof, or would you be happy with a Supra that is under the skin, largely the same car? But I've just got to say I love driving it during the week. It was very enjoyable. JC, so, can I ask, what are your thoughts on the Z4 styling? Um, look, I'm not a fan, but I, I don't hate it either. I'm probably on the fence um, on that. I think BMW has gone down a certain road. The yep. end of the spectrum being the new 4 Series Coupe with that immense grille. Um, and at the other end is, a, is some more subtle uh, kind of designs. I think this one sits somewhere in between. I was, I was okay with it. What are you talking about? I sense an opinion coming. I, I, I love the design of the Z4. Okay, wow. cool. 
I think, I think it was fantastic. It was designed by uh, an Australian guy, uh, Calvin Calvin Luck, who yes. uh, okay, yeah, 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 sort of um, yes. born and raised in Sydney, and, yes. and now works in Germany as a BMW designer. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you know, yes, the front end is is very busy, um, you know, but I think it works for for the type of car that it is. You know, yeah. a, a two door convertible sports car. It looks very aggressive on the road. Uh, yeah. There's a lot going on, but I, I think it it's it works. Cool. Yeah. I th- and I've got to say, aside, from, you know, the irony is when you're in the car, that's the last thing you're caring about <laughs> is what it looks like because you can't see that. Uh, but the the driving experience was absolutely super. I, I loved it to bits. Good. Um, so, so, yeah. Do you do you drive anything that that isn't six figures? I mean, <laughs> I've got, I heard I it? heard you refuse to climb into anything if it, unless it's about 130 grand. <laughs> you're always cottoning on to rumours, aren't you, Crafty? You're just ready to propagate those rumours. There's a there's a there's a base model Hyundai Venue out there right now. Okay, so <laughs> have no illusions. It's not all uh, you know top shelf stuff. I want but to speaking. Dive- no, no, sorry, mate. I want to dive in because in all the excitement of talking to you and Tung, I forgot yeah. to mention the most important thing about the Trail Rider 2 yeah. is that it's got a smaller engine. It used to have a 2.8, ah, now it's a 2-litre okay. turbo uh, diesel, but more power and torque. Power. Only, only a couple of marks upwards, but, um, yeah, yep. but uh, perfectly. It's, a, it's the way of it, isn't it? You're getting more power, more performance, and probably better uh, fuel efficiency, yeah. I'd imagine. Yes. And, yeah, and yeah. generally a pretty sort of unstressed view. It can be a bit noisy, but uh, I just thought I'd slip that in before. Very we... good. Thank you. Perfect. Well, speaking of, you know, slipping something in, it's time okay. for Musquatch. Musquatch. <laughs> right. So, okay, we kick it off with a Reuters story that uh, quotes the dear leader from a particular event that happened during this week. It was in Shanghai. It was called the World Artificial Intelligence Conference. And during that conference, he said that Tesla is very close, quote, to achieving level five autonomous driving technology um, and that he says they'll be ready more or less uh, by the end of this year to have the tech ready for level five, no hands off, brain off. You're just a passenger. Everybody in the car is a passenger. Uh, He says, I remain confident that we'll have the basic functionality for level five autonomy complete this year. Um, To which I'm saying, BS. That's, uh, (laughs) that that to me is straight up horseshit. I don't think that's gonna happen. That's another big bold promise that um, I'll eat my hat and I'm wearing a beanie, so it'll take a while um, if that is actually the case. Okay, you'd presume that nothing's going to come to market before the end of the year, that they're going to have the tech all done. But uh, there are some very, very clever brains around the world that are working on this. Some of them have parked it and said, oh, boy, that's a lot harder than we thought. I'm not privy to any of Tesla's engineering data, of course. But uh, I think that's a classic Elon big promise uh, that, yeah, that he, will not come to fruition. He says, he says these crazy things. And the old shares get a bit of an uptick, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. Generally, they like, do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we'll so get to that. Level, we'll get to level that. Level five is that full, like, autonomous robo taxi kind of it. level, isn't don't, it? You know, you, no you steering wheel, no pedal. Yeah. Blade no runner style sort of. Yeah. Yeah. You just get in a box that takes you somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it, it makes sense, or, you know, I think the technology is there if you wanted to develop something like that in a closed environment, right? Oh, you know? yeah. Oh, yeah. If you've got a car park out there that is, you know, 15 metres by 15 metres, you can plonk a self-driving car there. It could navigate that fine. Yeah. 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 I, uh, but I don't know about you guys. I've got some streets near where I live that I challenge any uh, level five car uh, <laughs> to have a go at. I really do. Yeah. But uh, yeah. anyway. And the, look, the next thing was you mentioned the, uh, the, the share price and maybe it needs a tick up. Um, Jalopnik, which is a site that I like, hat tip to them um, in America. They have said, their words, not mine, in case you forgot Elon Musk is an attention-starved dork, he sold an arseload of short shorts to remind us all. And uh, this is written by <laughs> the head of that site, Jason Torchinsky. Um, he says, I bet we all kind of remember that kid from high school who was a painful, socially inept dork who nevertheless craved the approval and attention of the popular kids with an often terrifying ravenousness. 
Uh, Elon Musk is the final form of that kid, is what, is what he's saying. <laughs> so wow. what he's done, because he dislikes short sellers so much, I think someone on Twitter came in with a pair of red shorts and they'd, you know, photoshopped um, short sellers or well, Elon had made something about the SEC and he put that on the side. So he's taken that and run with it and made these shorts to sell on the uh, on the Tesla website. And um, Chorchinsky says, look, they're satin short shorts, inferior, if you ask me, to a good, honest pair of hot pants. Um, so I kind of agree with him on that. And on Fraging the back, it says... Shorts. On the back, it says <clears throat> S3XY. And yeah. Jason says, uh, oh, hold on. Those are the model names of the Tesla lineup. And what? That looks like the word sexy. How many <laughs> levels does this go, Elon? Anyway, and he, he sold them for $69.420, cents. <laughs> right? So he's gone to thousandth of a cent um, after the decimal point. Yeah, yeah. And that's because the 69 is probably a sexual reference. And the 420 is a popular term more in the States um, about dope. But it's not great. It's not dope in that sense. It's just dope. And Torchinsky says, if you're, say, a 14-year-old boy unburdened by an excess of friends or life experience, this is hilarious. And I thought that was a pretty, pretty good take on what he's up to. Now, the interesting thing talking about shares too, the SEC settlement way back, I think it was 2018, and Elon tweeted out that he was intending to take Tesla private at $420 a share. The Securities and Exchange Commission got its knickers in a twist and said, no, you can't do that. The ultimate settlement was he had to step down as chairman of Tesla and appoint an independent person. Tesla had to pay $20 million and he had to pay $20 million. Now, what happened was he didn't think that Tesla should have to pay the $20 million because it was his tweet. So instead, he bought $20 million worth of Tesla shares um, as, as his share of that burden. And of course, with the skyrocketing um, share price, that has now made him a tidy profit. So in fact, paying his 20 million and Tesla's 20 million, at current price, he's $50 million ahead. So he's paid the fine and made money on it. You know, this guy <laughs> makes money even when he's not trying to. Um, but the share price, that is big news again. It's $1,365.88 a share. It was just over $1,200 last week. And realinvestmentadvice.com says, how far can Tesla's moonshot stock price go? And in, since the beginning of 2020, so in the first six months of this year, the aggregate market cap of 12 largest automakers is up 9.3%. So $803 billion. Why is it doing so well when car sales are down and it's such a, an uneven kind of environment at the moment? Well, it's not doing well. It's actually Tesla. It's all been driven by Tesla. So at the moment, um, without Tesla, that would be down 17%. But Tesla is up 244%. So it's driving the entire share market when it comes to automotive. Now, Tesla's worth now worth more than GM, Ford, FCA, Honda, BMW, Nissan, Hyundai, and Merck combined in terms of its market capitalization. But this site says for Tesla's market cap to be correct, the following must be true. They must continue to dominate the EV space. EVs must gain significantly in popularity. Other manufacturers must be incapable of producing competitive EVs. So they're saying that's a tall order, but this market price continues to climb. Um, there just doesn't seem to be any end to it. But pretty speaking good, of end to it... Pretty good for a dorky kid. <laughs> he is a dorky kid, but he's done all right. He's done all right. But um, speaking of an end to it, that is the end of our podcast. We have reached the finish line. And I want to say thank you, Tung. And thank you, Jesse. thank you, Crafty. No, thank and you. thanks. And thanks to our digital optimizer, change magi magician, and teddy bear surgeon, Mr. Pritchard, for his production perfection. Today, he's in a tartan top hat, his <laughs> sexy and I mow it t shirt, and fox <laughs> fur pants. Okay, they're vintage pants, but remember, peter.org for those wanting to help stop animal cruelty. Um, please pass on the word about the podcast and let us know your thoughts by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. 
If you're an iTunes listener, please rate and review us. And thanks to Marco and Bat Surfer for your recent reviews. We are still at five stars, believe it or not, on uh, Apple Podcasts. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube. But before we go, I was in the car with a mate of mine and his son, uh, the young bloke, said, Dad, why is Rose, that's his sister, called Rose? And my mate said, that's because your mother loves roses. The kid says, OK, thanks, Dad. To which my mate replies, no worries, HSV W427. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> right, yeah. It's a variation on the two dogs. But uh, anyway, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Good stuff.